Well, hello. My name is Anastasia Nagnostu, and uh, I'm going to present uh, a work that uh, we have done with Dr. Simon Taylor at Grand University. Uh, well, we attempted to create, uh, to develop a methodology for distributed simulation. And this is the work after uh, modeling of uh, the London Emergency Medical Services as a whole. So I'm going to give a little bit of introduction, the theoretical background, uh, the development rationale, and uh, the process of developing uh, the distributed simulation methodology and some conclusions at the end. So first, the motivation behind uh, this work is to, investig to investigate efficient ways for monitoring large-scale systems. And with large-scale systems, we mean systems that they, are, they consist of uh, subsystems that can be individually modeled as well. So in this model, in, in this way, we want to support uh, model reusability. So can we build uh, a large system from existing models or we need to build a new model uh, from scratch? Uh, usually large systems uh, characterize, characterized from, uh, by heterogeneity and complexity. And uh, the proposed methodology derived after uh, doing a model for the London Emergency Medical Services, but taking the system uh, as different parts and not just acknowledge the congestion of the A&E departments, uh, but, uh, but modeling the actual departments and not only the ambulance service. So dealing with heterogeneity, uh, it is actually, we took a hybrid approach. Uh, different subsystem comprise the system under study. And uh, th in this case, it is the ambulance service system and the A&E departments. So can a single simulation technique suit all? Can we use discrete event, agent-based system dynamics just to model the whole system? Uh, we, uh, we, we say that uh, the ambulance service has actually a high degree of interaction among its object. But the A&E departments, it is more process oriented. So entities are going through the system uh, as they are processed. So we said that one technique actually, it is not enough to describe uh, the whole system. And therefore we modeled the ambulance service using agent-based simulation and the A&E departments using discrete event simulation. Uh, so agent-based simulation, uh, the basic component of it, it is the agents and the environment. Uh, usually the agents move on different topologies, which can be grid, Euclidean space, networks, geographical information systems, or it can just be a spatial when we don't care about the location of the agents. Uh, the agents are highly interactive entities and uh, they interact with each other, each other and the environment. <laughs> they are governed by rules and they are able to change their behaviors according to the rules and according to the information that they take from other objects in the simulation. In agent-based simulation, the time progresses in discrete time steps and uh, usually the time advance mechanism it is a fixed increment of time. Uh, agents can encapsulate their environment, so uh, the, their own part, so they can reveal only the information that they want to reveal. And uh, here it is one of the similarities with object orientation, uh, which makes attractive actually the agent-based simulation in developers' community. Uh, tools for agent-based simulation, usually they are open source. We have NetLogo, Repast. Well, we have commercial tools as well, like any logic, uh, and many others, of course. And the other part in our project, it is discrete event simulation. Here we have the execution of su sequence of events as we go through time. Uh, we have a global state and uh, the system governed by state rules, not individual for each entity. Typically, discrete event simulation uh, has been used to model queuing system and is used. And uh, the entities are passing through the activities, competing for resources, and they, they don't interact with each other normally. 
Uh, in discrete event simulation, the time again progresses in discrete time steps, uh, but uh, the time advance mechanism is usually a uh, next event. We jump to the next event. It can be a fixed time increment, of course. Uh, the development tools for discrete event simulation usually are commercial packages uh, with a very good visualization and easiness of use. So uh, we said that we wanted to deal with uh, model reusability. What do we mean by model reuse? So let's assume that we have a complex system and we have uh, that comprises of uh, subsystems. We have, assumingly, models of these systems. So what do we do? How do we model the whole uh, complex system? Do we compose all these subsystems in one simulation package? So we create one model uh, from all, or find a way to connect the models, and they can be wherever they stand locally, just find a way that the models communicate their input with outputs and the information that we want to communicate. So one way to... Uh, connect the different components of a large system, it is using distributed simulation. Distributed simulation actually executes uh, on, in different processors over a network. This can be a local network, the internet, the cloud, or any other uh, network, computer network. Uh, distributed simulation models consist of interoperable models, so this means that the models can talk to each other and communicate. And therefore, the need, there is a need for synchronization of data and time. At the moment, uh, the most known organizations that they use, uh, uh, they, they deal with uh, standardization of synchronization of data and time. It is the IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, and the SAIS Organization Simulation Interoperability Standards Organization. So, in this project, we use uh, the high-level architecture at IEEE 1516 uh, standard, which is the most well-known for distributed simulation. Uh, high-level architecture, it is a federated uh, uh, architecture, so, and its individual model, uh, it is uh, a federate. In, in our case, we have the London Emergency Medical Federation, or Medical Services Federation, which consists of one ambulance service, and all the a and &E, the general a and &E departments in the area of coverage. The, uh, the programming tool for implementing uh, the synchronization, actually, it is the runtime infrastructure. And uh, here, uh, we, we program the way how to deal with uh, time management, uh, ownership, and uh, all the services that the standard provides. Uh, the RTI ambassador deals with the RTI calls, so each federate sends uh, information to the RTI, the information that they, uh, they want to communicate to the RTI, and through the RTI, they receive the response from the other uh, model. All communication is happening through the RTI. The models don't communicate uh, among each other. The second standard that we use, and this is more in the conceptual level, it is the SISO STD006 standard, and uh, this is the standard for uh, interoperability reference models. This was designed for commercial packages for distributed simulation, and they are defined uh, four types of uh, IRMs. The first type deals with the entity transfer, uh, entity in discrete event simulation. And uh, there are three subtypes. The first one is the general entity transfer, where entities just pass from one model to the other. Uh, the second uh, type, A2, it is the bound in the receiving element, which is actually when the receiving model has a limited buffer or queue to receive entities from other models. And the third subtype, A3, deals with the multiple input prioritization when the receiving uh, model uh, can accept entities from more than one uh, models. The second type, uh, type B, deals with the shared resources. So, for example, when two federates or more share the same resource. This can be in the, in the, in the EMS uh, case, uh, a specialized doctor or from pharmacy. The third type, C, deals with the shared event 
So when something happens in one model, how this affect and uh, simultaneously something else should happen on uh, on some and, and some other in model of the federation. And finally, the third type deals with the shared data sets when the two models need to share uh, common data structures. So it can be objects, uh, arrays, or more complicated. So why distributed simulation uh, for model reuse versus non-distributed? First, we have issues with data transfer and access problems. Each model, individual su subsystem model, has its own data. If we need to move this model in one package, we need to move the data as well. And uh, then uh, who is updating this data? Is it updated locally or uh, we can update it in the composed model at the end? Another issue, it is the privacy and data sharing. Uh, each organization is not uh, willing to share its data with other organizations, perhaps that they are uh, consisting of the whole of the big system. And then we have uh, model composability issues. Uh, the models usually they are built on different packages, or even in the same package, if we try to compose the models in one model, we may have a uh, variable name conflict or other issues uh, for composing the models in one uh, big model. And uh, lastly, it is the model execution time. As the models become larger and larger, it is more difficult to, to, run, to run actually the model and uh, with the iterations that we want. So we said that we use agent-based simulation and discrete event simulation and we want to make them communicate. First of all, we need to identify the semantic relationship between the two, uh, the two techniques. What do we mean when we say something in one technique? What do we mean when we say something in the other technique? We identified some, and perhaps there are more. So we say that in discrete event simulation, we have the individual entities and the resources. Usually these entities, they are passive objects that they pass through the system, the system processes. In the agent-based simulation, we have the agents, and both entities and resources are modeled, are modeled as agents. And they, these are active objects that they can make a decision and they can change their behavior. A second element in discrete event simulation is the queue, which is actually agrees with the queuing theory. And uh, in, in agent-based simulation, we don't have the queue notion there. Agents just wait. If, there are, if they cannot proceed to the next uh, activity. Then, uh, in discrete event simulation, we have attributes that uh, defines the entity's characteristics. It can be the age of an entity. In, this case, in our case, it was the patient's uh, condition. Or, and uh, in the, in the agent-based model, uh, we have the properties of the agents, which are objects in a uh, usually object-oriented programming. And then we have the event, and the event holds actually the same semasiology in both techniques. It is a specific time that uh, an activity begins or ends. Uh, the activity, again, it is the same as the event. Uh, it is the same for both uh, modeling techniques. And it is uh, actually uh, what action is happening when an event starts the activity and ends the activity. Uh, in agent-based simulation, we have rules that define the uh, individual agent behavior. In uh, discrete event simulation, we have system-level rules uh, that uh, defines the process that the entity flows uh, during the simulation. And uh, then again, it is the environment. We said that in agent-based simulation, the agents interact with the environment, learn from it. In discrete event simulation, the entities are not aware of their environment. They are just passive entities that they are going through the processes. Uh, the state, uh, it can be similar, it is similar in both techniques. And uh, it is uh, the set of all the global variables uh, that uh, describe the system at a specific uh, uh, time of the simulation. And finally, it is uh, the time advancement. Uh, both techniques are uh, time, uh, discrete time, 
and but agent-based simulation it is time driven and usually the time advance it is a fixed uh, in a fixed time uh, increment but the discrete event simulation usually it goes to it is event driven and it goes to the next event so in the mess methodology the rationale for this methodology first of all it was uh, because because modeling and simulation in general need a lot of effort and technical expertise uh, to be accomplished. And uh, then there is a need of standard procedures and terminology, and this will help modelers considerably uh, in their uh, work. It, furthermore, in distributed simulation, we need to define the interoperability level between the participating models, how they communicate and how much information they give away. And uh, also, we need to define time synchronization strategy, how we're going to proceed uh, the whole federation. So based on uh, this uh, logic uh, and on the, uh, well, the, mod the levels of potential interoperability model was developed uh, uh, for uh, distributed simulation, usually based on the high-level architecture. Uh, so uh, th there are seven levels of interoperability that they were defined in this model. And from the bottom uh, up, uh, we increase the, level, uh, the capability of interoperating with other uh, models. In the bottom levels, we have the first level zero, which is actually no interoperability at all. And the, the, the next level one, it deals with the technical interoperability. So uh, communication uh, protocols, uh, how the model communicate in, the tech in, in a network, in a technical aspect. Uh, the second uh, layer, it deals with interoperability. And from bottom, again, we, we have level two, which describes the syntactic interoperability. And it means that the models now are able to uh, share data. Uh, the second level three deals with semantic interoperability. So now the models not only share data, but they know what this data means for the other model. And the next level four, it deals with pragmatic interoperability. And this is actually uh, knowing what this uh, model means and how this, uh, this data is used in other models, what methods uh, they are used uh, in. Finally, the top uh, uh, layer deals with composabi composability, and this is the higher level of uh, uh, composability uh, capability. So we have level five, which describes the dynamic interoperability, and here the model can communicate and can actually change their behavior according to other models and information that they receive. And finally, the top level of conceptual interoperability uh, means that uh, Potentially, the models can uh, are able to connect to any federation, to any other, with any other model, because we are aware of the whole existence of the model. So, what is the purpose of uh, uh, of the of the of the modeling actually? And uh, based on this, uh, the development process it follows first a bottom-up approach, then a horizontal approach. And lay, uh, lastly, a top-down approach, which is first we have uh, the simulation steps of an individual, uh, a standalone model. Uh, then uh, divided these steps, hiding the details into phases, and horizontally uh, mapping these phases from a standalone model to a distributed model. Lastly disaggregated uh, these phases into uh, detailed steps for a distributed project, a distributed simulation project. A lot of methodologies exist for, uh, simulation, for simulation projects by Bank et al., Law and Kelton, Robinson, the cyclic, cyclic uh, methodology. Uh, all agree that almost all the activities in the uh, model building process are highly iterative. We slightly changed Banks et al. Uh, methodology just to indicate that uh, the data collection it is actually a parallel activity during the whole uh, model building process. 
and also we just indicate that the documentation process should start from the beginning and actually uh, feeding uh, during the whole process and finally reach the final report. So, during the first, uh, the problem formula, the, the first step it is the problem formulation and then the model building, conceptualizing, collecting data and uh, uh, programming, validating the process and finally experiment with the model. So, how can we divide in phases? First, we uh, we thought that it is a pre-modeling activity, which is the first phase and deals with the problem formulation. And then uh, all the development activity can be considered as the development phase, which is actually the, the, mo the actual modeling uh, activities. And the third phase, uh, it is the post-modeling activities, which deals with the experimentation of uh, the model. Uh, the second part, we said that it was a, a horizontal approach by mapping uh, the, the phases of uh, the standalone uh, methodology to a distributed simulation project. So first we have the planning phase, and actually this is the same in both uh, approaches. Either we're doing standalone simulation or a distributed simulation, the planning phase, the problem simulation process, it is quite the same. The most... Uh, uh, changes it is actually during the development phase so first uh, in the distributed uh, project we need to define the interoperability reference model and the interoperability level of uh, the of the uh, of the individual models uh, so and this comes in the conceptualization of distributed simulation and then when we when we move to the realization and actually programming the model we need to define what time management strategy we are going to use and then uh, implement the actual middleware for making them communicate. Uh, and lastly, in the third phase, the experimentation, in a standalone model, uh, the simulation will run on a single uh, machine. However, in the distributed simulation, it will run on a network, in a network of, uh, of uh, PCs. And therefore, we need to see if we have the resources and uh, how, what net network we are going to use. So finally, uh, uh, we disaggregate the phases in the, in the individual steps for a distributed simulation project. Uh, we can have N models contributing in the distributed simulation. And first of all, we need to define uh, the IRMs, so what, what type of uh, interactions uh, are happening between the models. In our example, we have the ambulance service model and the AME department model. So we say that first we have an entity transfer or uh, agent to entity. And this is when the patient uh, moves from the ambulance model to the AME department model. Second, uh, we have a type C IRM, which is a third event, and this is uh, when the ambulance model sends, wants to send an, a patient to an A&E, it needs to make this information known to the specific uh, hospital, so resources are uh, reserved. So an event is happening there, the resources are uh, reserved before the patient actually moving into the hospital. And the fourth, it is the safe data structure. The patient object from the agent based simulation moves as it is to the hospital model with all the attributes that it has and all the characteristics. Second, we need to see, do the model exist for the large system? If they exist, we need to modify on uh, the model so they can communicate. If they do not exist, uh, we need to build the models or some of them can exist, some of them needs to be built from the beginning. Uh, what simulations technique uh, these models are uh, there? Or if they are not there, in what simulations, simulation techniques we are going to build the models? In our case, we use agent based simulation and discrete event simulation, as I said earlier. And therefore, because it is not a single technique, we need to find the semantic relationships for these for the two different techniques, or even more. Uh, 
then we need to decide in the conceptualization phase what software simulate what uh, software for the simulation we need to use and uh, furthermore we need to decide what, what software for the RTI implementation uh, we will use in our case we used the uh, complete open source software we used repast for both agent based simulation and discrete event simulation which we need to modify a little bit uh, for the discrete event simulation because your past it is actually an agent based simulation tool and we need a portico RTI implementation for the middleware so then we need to define the transparency level uh, what each model will make known to the other models and uh, the global variables and the ownership which model actually can update the, the common vari the global variables. For example, in our case, uh, we have uh, the availability of the hospitals inside the uh, ambulance services model and inside the, the individual hospital. Which model is going to update the availability in order not to have conflict when they communicate? And this needs to be defined uh, in this phase. And then uh, for the middleware implementation, uh, for, for the distributed system actually, we need to define the synchronization protocol. Uh, are we going to, to use a conservative approach? So models cannot uh, go further in time locally as the system is, or we can use an optimistic approach so individual models can uh, proceed further in time, but actually there is a rollback mechanism, so if there is a mistake, they can go back to a previous state. And then again, we need to define the time advance mechanism, or, or the time advancement. So in HLA, we have uh, uh, the time advance request, so each individual model requests time advance from the RTI, uh, or we can uh, model it as a next event request. So it's a mod the models request time advanced to the time of when the next event is to happen. Finally, in the experimental phase, uh, we need to decide uh, in which network we're going to run the distributed simulation. Would it be a local network, a cloud? Uh, we run our experiments in a, lo a non-dedicated local network, which is easier. For example, if we need if we want to run the distributed simulation on cloud resources, it is more complicated and uh, we, ha we need to define the granularity of the system, how, how the uh, messages, usually in distributed simulation, we have a fine granularity. We send a lot of messages with small information, uh, with small amount of information. However, for cloud uh, communication, this is not a, uh, very much convenient, actually. So, uh, we need to define the resources and therefore, in our experiment, we decided first to run the model in a scaled down uh, London ambulance service. So, we scaled it down in one to five scale. We didn't do firstly the whole ambulance, uh, the whole London ambulance service. And we ran tests on uh, performance. So we ran on a single node and on the distributed computing and on the distributed environment uh, by increasing the number of federates that they are connected. Uh, the bottom line, the dashed line, it is the distributed environment. As the number of federates increase, we can see that uh, the runtime of the distributed simulation is almost constant, a little bit increased, but on a single node, it starts to increase considerably. And this is where an advantage of distributed simulation can be stunned. And then again, we run experiments on scalability. So we increase the workload uh, by 10, 20, and 30 percent and uh, observe how the system behaves. And uh, when we increase both emergency calls and both inpatient arrivals, uh, we saw that uh, it is actually analogous, uh, the runtime increase it is actually analogous with the percentage of uh, uh, workload increase. So we can conclude that uh, large systems usually they are complex environments that usually cannot model by one <coughs> single approach. Uh, we can reuse models by deploying distributed simulation. I think actually it is 
and more convenient rather than composing in one uh, package. Uh, we need standard terminology uh, for uh, end procedures and therefore we need a defined methodology. And uh, we need to define the interoperability level upon, uh, among the participating models in order to know what is shared with among uh, what. And uh, finally, the methodology needs to be revalidated and we're planning to uh, apply it to other uh, regions in uh, the UK uh, in other EMS systems. Thank you. Any questions? Please? We have one or two questions. Yes, I'm Simon from Perth, Perth, Salad Hill, Liverpool. Uh, with Simon Taylor, we connected to distribute your own signals and others. And we found validated um, DS is a bridge. It is. Did you find it? Yes, it is. Did. First of all, uh, the validation, each, one more, each individual model should be validated individually. Uh, secondly, the distributed system, how we validate it, we had IDs at, uh, for every uh, federate, uh, for every object that is passing from one to the other, time stamps, and we actually validated the model in this way, that yes, it, it is actually synchronized, it works properly. Yeah. But so it is difficult, yeah, there are no level, we, we manage this, but it's some of the different behaviours that mm -hmm. are part of the reason for doing the yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that it needs to be done in this area. Yes, validation and doing it in a distributed system. Have you had a chance to do the comparative piece between running the two simulations separately and seeing what interpretation you can reasonably make and how the interpretive value changes from going to a separate workload? You mean uh, operationally or the performance of the system, just yeah. to, uh, the results of the model? Yes, we, we, we run, we, we have actually the same results. Uh, actually, the, the models that are built for this purpose, they are quite abstract models. Uh, I wouldn't say that they can be used for modeling the operations of the each individual systems, because the purpose of this project was to, uh, to build actually the distributed system and make it interoperate. interoperate. Finally, uh, if the system interoperates uh, in the interface level, whatever the complexity behind it, it uh, wouldn't matter. So uh, the results that we've got, it is actually the same, but I wouldn't say that we can validate it at the moment. Uh, it needs further data and work to be done. Yeah.